Hello, I'm Steph and today we are looking at a Hillman Mink Series 3C from 1962. It's a funny old car really because in the 1960s when this came to market it was a medium sized family saloon. It comes in at 13 and a half foot which actually makes it smaller than the 2022 Mini Countryman. Now it's a funny old world because in the 1960s you probably would have known somebody who either owned one of these, had one on the street, in the family, maybe at work, but in today's world you can go to car shows all summer and not even get to spot one of these. So let's have a look at it thoroughly. What we're going to do in today's video is we're going to look around the outside, in the interior. I'm going to show you that 1600 engine under the bonnet, that boot that was really touted as having more than enough luggage space and then I'm going to take you out for a drive in the car because when this came to market it was known as the finest car in its class and today we're going to put that to the test and find out if it was marketing spiel or truly a car of its time. Odax Minx 1600 Minx Series 3C. It can be really hard when you talk about the evolution of a 60s classic car like the Hillman Minx Series 3C to really understand what's going on without a little bit of a backstory. So the Minx name was first used in the 1930s, I think in 1931 for the first time, for a completely different car. But of course, brands move with the times. Something sold in 1931 isn't going to change not be changed until in the 1950s. So what they did was they came up with the Odax range of cars from Roots. And the dynasty came to life through the Sunbeam Rapier in 1955. So that's where you first start seeing that styling. And if you're wondering what Odax means, it's actually Latin for bold, which the range certainly was. So you look at things like that American styling influences, you've got the chrome, you've got for added flair, you've got those curves, you've got the wrap glass of the back light and matching reverse slope of the rear side glass. Odak styling is really recognisable. And the design wasn't limited to the rapier that we've already mentioned and the trusty minx. It was also extended out to the Singer Gazelle in the autumn of 1956 because the first Odax minx was unveiled in spring 1956. So it all happens quite quickly. Now, when we're in the video later on, we talk a little bit about British hesitancy for looking too flashy. And in fact, it was that staid and stiff approach to design, which when many overseas buyers looked at British cars and felt they were just a bit boring. Now, Roots kind of knew that and they said, OK, well, we're known globally. We're going to do something a little bit different. And they did that with the Odax cars. And one of the most interesting things for me is, is that when you talk about the Odax cars, they change every year. But that's the thing with Roots because they didn't rest on their laurels and they felt that to get things right and to keep people excited on the forecourt, you had to have those regular updates. And by 1959, the cars were already, well, the Minx was already onto the Series 3. Now, these series updates weren't just a few piecemeal offerings like new colorways or a fancier radio. They did really step up. And even by the Series 3, that then sees a new larger engine, steering mechanism changes, and much, much more. Even done things like slight exterior tweaks. Now, by 1961, that's when you get your Series 3C, which is what we're testing today and that came to market and although the car is cheerful enough it was actually quite a budget affair and with sales tax increasing and everything going on it was still cheaper than the departing series 3b they were really sensing that buyers were starting to think about saving money when they were going to the forecourt and buying their new car before cars had been something that you would maybe buy and keep for life or keep for years and years and years time was changing and roots saw it now I talked about 1600 Minx when I started chatting to you here and said it's sometimes known as that and that's because it's got the 1592cc engine. It's the same one used in the Super Minx, however it was £80 cheaper than the Super Minx and also apparently the engine in this isn't as tuned as the Super Minx. 
Now the 1600 engine, the sales brochure promises, gives sparkling performance and vivid acceleration because you used to be able to just say these things and they don't entirely elaborate on that but the car does have a top speed listed as being in the high 80s so it's not too slow to be considered as something you could use today. For a budget car, it was still packed with brilliant care and thought, even down to things like steering maintenance, which was re-examined, because on this they introduced the greaseless nylon joint inserts at the outer track rods. They've also got a whole host of optional extras, including radio, heating and ventilation kit. Yes, heating and ventilation kit. Um, what else did they put in? You've got the steering column gear change, which we talk about later, and the white wall tires. You've also got special accessories. You've got clock, oil gauge, ammeter, overriders, reverse lights, and there are other small details as well that you can get. But what were people saying about it? Well, Motor Magazine at the time gave the car a decent enough review, and they actually said that everything else in that 700 price bracket when this came to market was inferior in either space or speed. So actually, that is a cracking review. And it's not a bad choice for budget buyers who fancied a car which actually didn't look entirely budget, although they had made a few small cutbacks from the outgoing car, things like no carpets in the rear. But who owns a car like this in 2023? And most importantly, why? Well, it's back to a familiar channel regular, Kev, to tell us why he picked this Series 3C Minx. Hi, Kevin Hurst here, and you know me, any excuse to ditch the overalls, dub on the cravat, and get ready for action. This is my 1962 Hillman Minx, bought last summer from um, Facebook Marketplace, obviously a dangerous place to go <laughs> to go delving when you bought. Bought it off a, a lovely guy up in the up in the northeast, who it was his uncle's car. Sadly, uncle died, and he wanted the car to go to um, you know to be restored, looked after, um, you know, usual. Lost his storage space, the usual usual story. The car is is very original had a lot of work done to it the interior is very very good it's all original on the inside the color's been sprayed a different color i believe the chap's uncle used to do weddings in it because there was a wedding ribbon on the back and stuff um absolutely lovely guy he was he was terrified about the car going for banger racing He'd inherited it from his uncle, and his uncle had obviously loved the car, but he, he was frightened of it going down that road, which would have been an absolute, absolute awful, really. So I don't think it was the money that he was bothered about. He just wanted the car to go to a good home. I've subsequently spoken to him a few times and messaged him and telling them that we're doing a, a video on the car, and I've told him about the progress made on the car. Um, it drives absolutely lovely. I've got it for filming. Um, probably, ne probably will never will never sell it. I've no interest in selling it. And it's just it's just a very very lovely car. It's like a comfortable pair of slippers. When you jump in it, you can drive it. And I would drive anywhere in it. It's absolutely lovely. I'm sure it was obvious when we were looking round, but there's an awful lot of space in here. But it can be quite hard to picture what that space looks like size-wise at home when you're watching a video and you're not seeing it at a car show in person. So I wanted to give you something to work off. Now, in terms of room, the front bench seat and the rear bench seat are both 50 inches wide, which gives you an awful lot of room for passengers. Because, of course, this is the era where seatbelts just weren't fitted to cars so you could pile as many people in here as you wanted and really for the era it wouldn't have been uncommon to have mum or dad driving loads of kids piled in here people piled in the back essentially nobody was needing to wait at the bus stop now bench seats are funny because I think a lot of American viewers watch them and it's not without mentioning America that we make this video because of course this car fits in as part of the Odax range and the head designer of the Odax range was Lowry and 
he'd come from a world of American design. He's, I think he designed the Studebaker Goldhawk, but he brought with him some American flair. But they had to be quite careful where they put that American flair in and they didn't put too much in. Because do you remember when we did, I think it was the Vauxhall Victor video, we talked about how it came to market and people said, oh, it's so American, it's a bit brash, it's a bit too much. Um, because of course, British tastes were still very kind of conservative and understated. So even when this came to market and people knew it had that American connection, they even tried to sell the discreetness and that don't worry it's not too much in the brochures because when they talked about the chrome inside the car which of course is flashed here there and everywhere and they describe it as a discreet use of chrome it's a funny time whereas nowadays you get cars that are just sold all over the world and you get what you get now coming back inside here when it was sold and it went out in the brochures it was sold as controls to hand and the idea was was that you weren't having to reach over here or up here everything you could just reach slightly and it was there it was meant to be the finest car in its class and it really thought about that in every element of it except that you didn't actually get that much for your money because i think at basic standard so no added extras whatsoever it was 702 pounds but then when you started adding the extras on that's when you started in carrying extra costs so in fact so this car does have a few of the optional extras so i'll talk to you about them so one of the optional extras is an addition to this panel here so usually you would just have your water temperature here but it's had the amateur added and it's also had the oil pressure gauge added so someone paid extra for those and if you ask me that's money well spent and i'll tell you where else has had money spent and you would have spotted it if you were looking closely when we looked under the bonnet they've also paid for a heater now a heater i think was and i'm rounding this down by the way because a lot of things are x pounds so many shilling blah 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 we're just going to round it down to the nearest pound so the heater was 12 pounds but if you wanted a blower as well that was an extra five pounds so that was an additional optional extra that somebody paid for on here now something that's advertised in the brochure is you'll notice i think it's called i was reading the brochure and i think it's called a sports floor um, transmission unit which essentially for us is a traditional transmission unit on the floor but of course if you know anything about old cars you'll know that before all that you would have had column change which is what your older minxes would have had but on this of course you've gone down to floor now if you were a traditionalist and you wanted to keep that column change because that's all you'd ever known that's how you like to drive that was something they could fit but you've had to make it clear when you put your order in now it's a funny one because when you look at the brochures it's broken down into we can also do this and we can also um, we also offer these optional extras and there seems some discrepancy about whether you had to pay extra for column change or that was essentially like today where you might suggest you might go for an automatic or a manual so I'm not entirely sure if that was something you had to pay for or the cost around that so my apologies for not knowing now let me show you what else we've got we've got the fuel gauge We've got the speedo, this really attractive dial in the middle here that says Roots Group. Now, I'm not sure if that was fitted to all the cars or you could have got something extra in there. We've got a series of pulls as well. You've got your choke, you've got your lights and you've got your wiper. Now, the one thing I will say is, is that this is another one of Kev's budget buys in that it needs a few little bits and pieces, but he said, for the price it was, and it was an absolute steal, he said, I'll put up with a few bits being a little bit bizarre or needing fixing. And one of the things is, is those wipers. So whilst you see the control is on there, and I'm pleased that nobody's removed that, there is this aftermarket panel over here, and that pull on there is currently replacing the wiper switch. Now, as you can see, that's everything pretty much in a nutshell. It's incredibly basic in here, but that's not to its detriment. It's lovely. One of the things that I will say, actually, and I've totally forgotten to to mention this is we talked about this when we did a Morris Minor video in that even at this point in 1962 with Morris you had to pay extra for a sun visor one of the things that they talk about in the brochure for this is that both the sun visors are included 
What a wild time to be buying a car. Can you imagine saying that nowadays? Oh yeah, you, you, you get a sun visor, don't panic. But this was, for me, a bit of a golden age of motoring. So there's so many different people doing different things, trying different things, different designs. Cars were different. You could look at a car in passing and you knew what it was. Nowadays, they're all just blobs, aren't they, by and large. Now, a hangover from the fact that we've got these bench seats and the fact that you've obviously got that column change, those column change early beginnings on the early series, is our handbrake. Because you might have looked at it dead quickly and thought, actually, where is the handbrake? It's down here on my right-hand side. So if you're watching me drive today and you see me reach down, that's why. And I guess the one last thing that I will tell you is, is do you remember when we took that Triumph Toledo out just recently and I talked to you about the nice thing about cars from the late 60s going into the early 70s is you start getting synchro on all four forward gears or five and on this we don't have synchro on first. It is on second, third and fourth and reverse is over on the far left. So, yeah, I think I've talked through everything for you. I know that's quite a quick whistle-stop tour. I'm going to let you have a listen to that 1600 engine from the back because I know sometimes sound can be slightly muffled when we go out for a drive. And then we're going to pop out for a drive and uh, see what she's all about. <laughs> us up into top gear, that fourth gear there. Now if I come across as quite confident driving this, it's because it's not my first rodeo. In fact, I think I've shot this video now three or four times, including a driving segment today on the country roads that I took that Toledo out on. But the way that other drivers were treating me was actually terrifying because they were driving at me, aggressively up behind me. And that's something that you sometimes get when you take old cars out of a certain age, is people treat you like sometimes you see people treat old people in busy public places, just barging past, don't have any time. No one's in that much of a rush. It's the weekend, for goodness sakes. Now let's talk about what she's like to drive, because if we ignore all the irritants outside, the angry drivers in their SUVs and their Audis, the driving pleasure is second to none in this. You've got these fantastic wide open screens front and rear. You've got all the glass around here. You've almost got 100% visibility with these extra thin pillars here. It is fantastic. And sometimes I get into stuff like this as a woman and I feel like I'm too short to be able to drive it confidently. But even though we've got that bench seat and it's a you can move the seating position slightly but not massively it's still fine enough to be driving and some of these extra mirrors just help aid that confidence as i drive now you've probably noticed already that the exhaust is blowing a little bit but when i was talking to kev about it he said to me well you know what it's like with old cars exhausts always seem to be blowing don't they um <laughs> it's just one of those things it's, Old cars are like painting the fourth bridge, they're never fully done. Now as we travel out on this wide open road, I'm sure you probably hear that that road noise is absolutely deafening inside. Now in terms of what that's like, to give you something to equate it to, it's louder than a Morris Minor, so much louder that I can barely hear myself think as I drive. But I'm having a brilliant time because the steering is light and responsive. It's easy to change through that transmission unit. It keeps up with the traffic as well as you need it to with that 1600 engine. And even though you want those nine inch drum brakes, which allegedly don't have fade like normal brakes because they've got 121 square inches of braking space, the brakes are sharp enough. They're doing their job. And I think that sometimes people see stuff like this and they think it's 
going to be an antiquated old driving experience that they're just not going to enjoy. But actually, when you get behind the wheel of this, when you experience it, it's not that far removed from driving a car from, say, the 1980s. You just don't have as many controls as you would. Because the steering, look, if you see, well, I say it's responsive. It's responsive to the era. But something from the 80s or 90s, it is not at all. But it's light enough that even someone who maybe isn't used to driving old stuff could get in this and wouldn't find it too much of a struggle. Now, it's funny because I can't really tell you how it compares to competitors because a lot of its competitors things like the console, the Morris Oxford I haven't actually driven I've only ever been in a passenger noise wise inside the cabin it's definitely the noisiest comfort wise these fully sprung seats that they really upsold in the brochure are so comfortable you could travel for thousands of miles in this and not feel uncomfortable it's that armchair comfy quality and even when we're coming around and you feel that suspension throwing up and down, it's great. It does it. It's not a bone shaker. It's actually an incredibly comfortable and easy to drive car. Now, I know that you're probably looking at this and wondering, but what are the spares like? We talked about it quite a lot in the recent Toledo video. And in fact, when I was talking to you all on social media, you were saying that spares are something that really frighten you all about the classic car movement, as in, what can you get? Is the availability there? Well, listen, I've spoken to Kev. He told me that when he needs stuff, he goes to a company called Speedy Spares. They have pretty much everything mechanically that he needs. The real struggle is when you get to body panels. But if you're good with making stuff up or you're good with a tin of filler, I shouldn't say that, should I? But if you are good with something like that, then look, it's not too much of a struggle. So really, if you are looking for one of these and you've watched this video and your heart's set on it and you're like, yeah, I can deal with the body panels, I think the buyer's caution on this would be to go for something where the body is in the best shape possible. And if you are left having to maybe rebuild an engine or sort the brakes out, those are the things that are far more doable. It's been a pleasure bringing you out in this today, actually, because we shot it a few times and it hasn't gone to plan. So to take you out today, even though we've got all that wind, which is slightly hampering this talking bit inside, it's been so much fun. And it's been great to show you another British car of the golden era, in my opinion, of motoring. Now, until next Sunday when we're back and we're looking at something very different again, take care and drive safely.